All right, good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for putting me at the very end of the day when... Hey, we love you like a brother. We do. When every, everyone's uh, been sitting here. So uh, congratulations to everybody that's still awake, that's still here. Uh, the good news is, is that this is way more exciting than IT. It's more bloody, it's more fun, it's more hands-on, and if you ever want to have a good time, come hang out with me. We will go do some simulation, and it, I, guarantee, I guarantee you'll have fun. So this is the disclosure. I think it's the same one you've seen about 50 times. The only other thing I want to add to this is that I am a perinatologist. So as we start talking about acronyms and things like that, I will explain any obstetric acronyms, I promise. So here's our briefing outline. So here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that medical simulation is here to stay. It is a critical component. If you want to have world-class healthcare, there's no debate anymore. We're not gonna spend a ton of time today talking about why this is so important, although I have to tell you some stories and I have to show you some pictures, but really, it's here. And if you wanna have a world-class healthcare system, it will involve medical simulation. The great news is, is that the military is doing things that are recognized on a national and international level. However, there are opportunities to do things better together and to get the job done, say, even more effectively. Centralization is coming. I, I think that you've heard that message uh, just in the last uh, few hours, and medical simulation is no exception to that. The Defense Health Board in 2009, when Walter Reed was being planned, they actually had a medical simulation center in the new Walter Reed, and it was taken out. It, it went away, and the Defense Health Board came back, and they, they actually said, it's really interesting that the military, being so far ahead in medical simulation, does not have a simulation center in their hospital. They said, if you want to have world-class health care, this is a component. And guess what? 5,000 square feet showed back up in the plans about a week later. So they also came out and said, while coming late to medicine, simulation is now recognized as essential for training, competency, and refresher training for clinicians. So I'm going to start with the story, because it's late and because pictures are fun. So this is not a story of an actual person, but it's put together from several actual cases. So let's say Sergeant Smith is on a convoy mission. Afghanistan, Iraq, you can name the place. His vehicle struck by an improvised explosive device. His team provides immediate care, which they've been trained on, with a tourniquet calls for an air evac. He's evacuated to a combat support hospital and stabilized, eventually transferred back to an MTF in CONUS. At the same time, his wife, who's been waiting for him to come home, is pregnant. She's 32 weeks, and he comes home, and she's spending every single day in the hospital taking care of him <clears throat> and working with him. Of course, at 32 weeks, and so this is the OB acronym, PPROM. Anybody? Preterm premature rupture of membranes. Her water breaks. So, her water breaks, she starts bleeding, she has a placental abruption, and she requires an emergency C-section, and the baby goes to the NICU. Good news is, everybody's happy, everybody's okay. Why is this story important? Because we train every single step of that care with simulation. From the battlefield, where we train people how to put on a tourniquet, how to do a surgical airway, how to do stabilization at the combat support hospital. These are just some pictures of simulators. And if you want to know how good they are, this is how good the trauma simulators are. When we were having one delivered to us, they were bringing it down in a van. And the person who was bringing it, he had them out because he'd been doing some demos. And he had them in the back of the van, and they were kind of bloody. They looked kind of like the one in the middle here, although they're even better. I'll, I'll show you a picture. And he stopped at McDonald's. And he went to McDonald's, he got lunch, and when he came out 20 minutes later, there was a SWAT team around his van, wondering because they'd gotten a call about dismembered corpses in the back of his van. So it really is that real. And if you think that's one story, I just did a simulation course two weeks ago in Arizona, and the same thing happened. So um, our simulators are pretty good. But the reason I tell that story and the reason I put these pictures up here is that medical simulation and training touches every single patient that we care for. So what are simulators? So if you look at these pictures, I'll tell you in the top picture on the right, there's something that's wrong. I'm gonna talk about simulators and then I'll tell you what's wrong with it. So there's physical task trainers. We can put in central lines, epidural placement, airway management, virtual reality trainers. We have the highest fidelity things. We can practice surgery. We can do colonoscopies, endoscopies. That's what's going on in the top right. We have full-size trauma mannequins. The one you see on the bottom there, that's the one that the SWAT team went and saw. And then we also have huge human patient actors. So if we're practicing how to counsel somebody for surgery, bad news, bad outcomes, things like that, it's much more effective to talk to a person. So patients, so standardized patients, humans, can be simulators as well. So what's wrong with that picture in the top right? You have a perinatologist doing a colonoscopy. <laughs> it's a bad idea. 
So why medical simulation matters to the DHA? So patient safety for every patient. There are limitations in our educational processes. They, they're just there. Whether it's work hour restrictions, whether it's the ability to practice for life-saving complications in contingency operations on the battlefield, putting on a tourniquet, it really is awful to have to learn how to do emergencies on actual patients. I will tell you that the reason I got into medical simulation is because I had a horrible shoulder dissocia. It's where the shoulder gets stuck, the baby's coming out, it's stuck, you have to go through a list of maneuvers, and the problem is the most senior person in the room is the one that gets to do it. And it was me, it was awful, it was terrible. I went out and I said, you know what, there's gotta be some way to learn how to do this that's not practicing on a real person. There are new procedures and things that come up all the time. So for doing surgical airways in theater, there was a report that came out that 30% were being done incorrectly. They started working with simulators to try and address that. Uh, Ebola, so what you see on the right there, so how many people on CNN saw Dr. Gupta squirt chocolate sauce on somebody? Did anybody see that? He was trying to show how hard it is to do the, the PPE. So at Madigan, they actually did it more scientifically and a lot better. They actually sprayed them with an invisible spray when they would get infected, and then they put a black light on and they showed them, here's your PPE, and here's how you need to get dressed and get undressed for this. Hemostatic bandages, malpractice concerns. Malpractice still happens. Malpractice payments are still done. The average malpractice payment in the United States for an obstetric claim is $2.5 million. Okay, there's a money part here too. It is a requirement. If you want to have a board certified OB, sur, a surgeon for OBGYN anesthesia, if you want to be board certified in anesthesia, you have to go and when you take your boards, you will go to a mock OR with a, with a standardized patient and a simulator and you will get tested. So if we want to have trained physicians who are board certified in multiple specialties, you have to have this. Potential for live training. I'm not going to talk about all of the different things about this, but you know what? Live tissue training is becoming less and less common. I'm not going to talk a lot about the evidence, okay? You can look at the slides. We have it in so many different places now. Whereas five to seven years ago when we made these arguments about this is important, this is necessary, we didn't have a lot of evidence. It was just this is the right thing to do. Guess what? Now we have evidence. Now I can pull up paper after paper and I can show you that when we train with simulation for specific things that we can improve outcomes. So what limits the effectiveness of medical simulation? And these are universal, but they're really applicable to the MHS. So a single provider gets a simulator, has a great idea, gets motivated, does something awesome, and then they transfer. They PCS. We're a very mobile population. And then what happens? It sits in the closet. When we did a needs assessment for the Central Simulation Committee for the Army, I got a picture of three $60,000 simulators dressed up as Larry, Moe, and Curly sitting on a couch. And that's unfortunately a common thing. Lack of standardization, we've heard a lot about standardization. Say it's hard for everybody to keep reinventing the wheel. Minimal and inconsistent funding and a lack of a comprehensive long-term enterprise strategy. So I will tell you this slide took a long time to put together. This is where we are right now. So if you can untangle that spider web and you can get the Gordian knot undone, I'd love to hear it. But this is where we are right now. And the, thing, the funny thing is, is that when we go and we talk, we find people that are doing amazing things all over the enterprise. It's just not being done in a coordinated manner. So I tried really hard to put together all of the relationships and who works with who and how it all goes, and that really is what it looks like. So what's the current structure? So there's really four different components <clears throat> where we use medical simulation. Graduate medical education, we use it at the MTF, combat casualty care, and then initial education. <clears throat> Pardon me. What you can see is how it's divided up amongst the services. So for the Army, the Central Simulation Committee, which I'm the chair of, we do GME. That's our job. We also support the MTF to some degree. The local education and training works at the MTF, and then for combat casualty care, we have the Medical Simulation Training Center, the MSTC, which is the only palmed medical simulation program that exists right now. And then for initial education, you have the AMED Center and schools in the MEDC. The Air Force and the Navy have a tiered structure where they have a central program office that I'll show you a little bit more about, and they have tier ones that then take care of tier two and tier three. So here's Army Medical Simulation and all of the different players in it. I want to draw your attention to the top one, which is MSTC. So the Medical Simulation Training Centers are responsible for the initial training of 68 whiskeys, the sustainment, and the validation of that training. They are required to train every single 68 whiskey. When they come back, they're responsible for keeping them current, and they do a phenomenal job. So that really is the majority of the tactical critical care. 
The Army Central Simulation Committee is on the right. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So the Army Central Simulation Committee was funded in 2007 under an Advances in Medical Practice grant. So it started with, without, I mean, literally just as kind of a one-year deal. It now has oversight of GME simulation training at all 10 Army hospitals. It's kind of migrated, honestly, at those hospitals to be involved in the MTFs as well. We cover 15 different specialties at all 10 sites. We have specialty advisors for every single specialty, and we train over 54,000 providers annually. So the Air Force, which has a much cooler logo, uh, the Air Force Medical Modeling and Simulation Training, they have a central program office. So about the same time that the Army was standing up the Central Simulation Committee, the Air Force did a needs assessment. And they spent a lot of time building the backbone and building the skeleton of what they felt was be needed for medical simulation. And so what they have is they have a central program office that oversees and supports medical modeling and sim. And as opposed to having separate places that are doing the combat training and the GME and the MTF, they have an overall structure that actually sits in one place. They have a tiered structure, so tier one supports tier two and tier three. And then they also have specialty sites. So they have their CCAT training. They have a joint medical readiness. They actually work with the Uniformed Services University as well. They have a standardized process for curriculum development and implementation. And for every SIM operator that they hire, they have an online course that they make people go through called SIM 101 and 201. Those are really nice basic simulator operator training programs that have the, uh, the potential to be used across all three services. They look at data-driven solutions. They have a portal for communication and resource, resource sharing. Their logistics are more centralized. And they have an integrated network um, between the SIM sites to look at best practices. This is just a, an example of their tiered structure. And you can see the different tier one sites and then all of the sites that they support underneath there. The Navy, so about the, so a few years after the Army started the Central Simulation Committee, then the Air Force came on board and had the AFMAS, then the Navy said, this sounds like a good idea. And so they basically have taken a, a little bit from the Army and a little bit from the Air Force. So they have a central office called the NMAS that actually sits in the same place as the AFMAS down in San Antonio. But they also have a central simulation committee that looks a little bit more at GME. And so they have oversight and support of MedMod and SIM across the enterprise. And again, you can see they went to a tiered structure as well. So they have tier one mentor sites, tier two, three, and four mentee sites. And then they have an operational focus as well. Some of the focus areas you'll see here, these are essentially the same uh, as the Air Force. And really, it's modeled after, it, it's made after the Air Force model. Now, the Marines, the Marines give us what they usually do, which is blood. Uh, nice, bloody training things. So TCOM has an amazing program where they do pre-deployment trauma training. Um, and a lot of the stuff that they have done, from the MAT trainer, which is a multiple amputation trauma trainer that has animatronics, literally made by a Hollywood company, and it squirms around. It's crazy. Um, and strategic operations cut suits. Has anybody in here seen a cut suit? So a cut suit is a wearable simulator. You put it on, it has basically um, a ballistic plate underneath it, and you can do actual procedures on a patient. So for instance, you have somebody put it on, you have a gunshot wound, or you have uh, another injury, and you can actually have to do a surgical airway on a patient that's rolling around and trying to breathe. So there's a Kevlar plate underneath to protect it, so, but you actually take the scalpel, you actually make the incision, you actually put it in. And I will tell you that when you're doing it and they grab your arm and try and gasp and tell you they don't want to die, it's really hard to ignore them. So it's fantastic. It's, it's exactly what you would think the Marines would be doing. So, so again, that's been, that has been a great contribution from the Marines. And the good news is we've been able to actually push that to other, um, other areas as well. We have the MetC, which trains uh, over 20,000 graduates a year. Again, this is uh, on the initial training. And medical simulation is involved at different levels there as well. We have the Valgie Hemming Simulation Center that opened in 1999 at the Uniformed Services University. They're up to over 30,000 square feet of training space. USU students that go through get at least 34 visits during their four years there. I'll tell you that this is such a draw that when the new students come and they're trying to get people to sign up, that they bring them to the simulation center. And they always say, oh my gosh, that is, that's where I want to go. It integrates large groups for team training. They do a significant amount of simulation research. They have a multi-million dollar research portfolio. And they have every kind of simulation that exists. They have standardized patients. They have a virtual reality, a wide area virtual environment that's as big as a basketball court. And again, anybody that wants to come take a tour, just let me know. Surgical and procedure skills, computer-based, and teamwork-focused simulations. 
There's the JPC-1, Medical Simulation Modeling and Training, and they are kind of the research branch. So they have different initiatives. They have the Combat Casualty Training Initiative, where they're looking at, part of their funding actually is looking at live tissue versus simulation and trying to see if they're equivalent. They're also looking at advanced combat training, so things that can be done on the front line. There's the medical practice initiative that's trying to look at initial training and sustainment training, things like virtual reality patients to see if we can use those. And then there's the health focused initiatives looking for more chronic illness and, and self-care. There's the JPO MMS, which is a joint program office for MedMod and SIM. And again, this is on the acquisition side. It was done in partnership with PEO STRI and it coordinates with MA MHS regarding selection and utilization of, this is just, as a perinatologist, I'm learning so many new acronyms. I've never heard of TADS. I didn't know what a MOG, an MBOG, MOGALITO, MDAG, POG, I had no idea. Anyway, sir, um, I'm learning. Um, but the JPOMS is basically, one of the things is that because things have been done in a silo, we don't have a central acquisition strategy across the services. So the joint program office was stood up in a provisional status in September of 2013 to help address this. There's the Federal, Federal Medical Simulation Training Consortium. So a few years ago, about five, as things were starting to stand up and people realized all the really cool stuff that everybody was doing in silos, the leadership of the different organizations got together and said, you know what, we really would like to collaborate. And so they formed the FMSTC. It is a collaborative partnership. It does not have authority, but it has the membership of all of the people that are involved in this. So from the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the VA, DHA. Um, and basically, it's a collaborative process. And this is actually where, when Dr. Woodson was looking at MedSim, he went to them to ask the initial questions. So what are the issues for simulation for the DOD? First of all, MedSim is a standard of practice. It affects quality of care. There is excellent work being done. I mean, I can't tell you the level of work that's being done right now. It is phenomenal. The lack of centralization gives us an opportunity to be better. Um, but we really, really, really need an enterprise strategy. So what's going on now? So the provisional JPO MMS office was started uh, in September 2013. Dr. Woodson came and basically said, I really feel like this is an important issue. He came to the FMSTC. Um, that I became the chair of about a year and a half ago um, and said, this is something that I feel like is important. It needs to go through the MHS governance, okay? The services have to be asked. The services have to have input. This can't be, you know, just a, I think this is important. It has to go through the process. And so we started briefings through the MHS governance and created a med, mod, and sim training working group. There was an F in it. We had to take the F out because apparently you can't have a federal task force. We had to change it from a task force to a working group. It's okay, all that's, it only took about seven months to get that done. Um, the decision was made to charter it under the Future Shared Services team, and we're working on the plan. There's really three parts to the plan. So when you see on the slide, we're presenting the plan by the end of the calendar year, that is true, but let me tell you which part of the plan. There's really three parts to the plan. Number one is the acquisition strategy and the requirements generation. So one of the things we have not done great, we have not done well in terms of the MHS is defining our requirements in a manner that the rest of the DOD understands. So I've learned what JSIDS means. I don't know how it works, but I've learned what it means. And so we have actually, through a CBA, have put together a requirements process and looked at how the JSIDS process can work within the MHS, and that is deliverable one. And that will be done by the end of this month. It is being staffed. I will not tell you what the final decision is because I don't know. Um, because that is above my level, but it is in the process of being staffed. Steps two and three are looking at what the organizational structure will be, and then also what specifically the gaps are. So here's the working group membership. You can see that there's five voting members, Army, Navy, Air Force, DHA, and the Uniformed Services University, and then there's a significant number of ad hoc and supporting non-voting members. So here's the concept, and the thing I wanna draw your attention to is the word concept. This is not a decision. This is not a decision brief. This is an information and tell you one of the things that we've talked about as a working group uh, in terms of a potential way forward. The other thing I'll tell you is when you see those arrows and you see arrows going both ways and different things, please ignore the arrows. Just look at the, just look at the links. Um, so one of the things we've talked about is we have an aft mast. We have an end mast. 
we have the Army who has the Central Simulation Committee, and then we also have the medic piece. So what, we, what we've seen is the Air Force and the Navy sitting together in one place. What we'd really like to see is we'd like to see, and you can call it joint, you can call it shared, you can call it whatever the right term is that makes it happen. I really don't care. But what we'd like to see is we'd like to see the services working together and taking all of these great things that we're doing and to have a common structure so that when you look at the medic training that it all gets done and the best practices happen, that the MTS gets supported so that everybody has the same stuff. I will tell you, I mean, the models are out there. I'll tell you from the Central Simulation Committee that what we have, every single hospital that has a family medicine program has exactly the same equipment. They have exactly the same curriculum. Okay, when you have the MSTC, everybody has exactly the same stuff. And there are opportunities to put that out across the enterprise and for people to come together, make that decision, and then make it happen. And because we have acquisitions on board, because SOCOM wants to play, everybody wants to play. Everybody is very interested in this. So here's some of the anticipated benefits. Remove the silos, retain service-specific service missions. We're not gonna tell the Army that you have to train people how to do all sorts of stuff on an airplane while it's flying around when that's the Air Force's mission. We're not gonna train the Air Force people how to work on a submarine. Okay, we're, we're not, we say, we're, we're trying to apply rational thought here. Uh, we'd love to have a single point of contact because right now, if you wanna know what kind of training is going on, there's not one single place you can go, ask the answer and expect to get a, com a comprehensive answer. There just isn't, we'd love to have that. We wanna maintain connection with subject matter experts. We wanna make sure that the wartime knowledge that we are getting from people coming back from the field that's being put into training, that we continue to distribute that across the enterprise. And we want to standardize training across the services wherever appropriate. So what's the way forward? Medical simulation, <clears throat> it's, it's an interesting thing because it's a paradigm shift in how we train. Okay, but for anybody that's had to practice an emergency on an actual patient, if you had the opportunity to do it on a, on a simulator, to do it over and over until you got it just right, before you had to do it on somebody real, I guarantee every one of you would want to do that. And you'd want that for your family members. The time has come to integrate it into not only our practice, but in a centralized manner. And the great news is the people at the ground level, they're not trying to hold on to it. When we go and we talk and we, we, we listen to people, not one person has said, no, 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 this is what we're doing and I'm not sharing. They all want to share. They all want the best stuff across everything. So critical next uh, steps, the report's going to come out. Um, we definitely need support from leadership, and I'll tell you, I feel very strongly that we have it. Um, organization staffing, potentially a joint, shared, whichever word you want to use way forward is something that we're looking at. So again, almost the last slide. For the conflict that is, for the patients that aren't, for the challenges to come, you know, people say, can it solve everything? I say yes, but, you know, and if you want to know how much I believe in it, that was my office when I was at Madigan. And when they asked me to come to the school and to work on some of this, I went and I moved to a closet. So that's how important <laughs> I think it is. And that's all I have. How about, uh, General Merrill, why don't you talk a little bit because, uh, um, you know, the, the collaboration and the, I, I use the term getting the product to market, okay? Get a standardized product to market, whether it's a curriculum or whether it's a, a you know, a, a training a gadget, so to speak. But the relationship that you've started to already uh, 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 create between education and training director, and again, these are parallel efforts going on. But now, as 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 we say in the flying world, they're coming to the merge. So you know, if you guys can kind of talk a little bit about that, that's key. Well, in, in a nutshell, as General Robert already said, my prior job was the ATC certain. So I owned AFMAX, and I had NMAX come into my building. So these folks do all partner. They work great with each other. And, and so reaching out uh, to Dr. Peering, and, and uh, it makes all the sense in the world that there would be that subject matter expert, potentially a ninth member or tenth member of the education training directorate that would help guide how this would roll out for the entire MHS. Once again, not to, not to tell the service what to do, but for initiatives like maybe TCCC and how we do that type of training, maybe there does need to be some centralized guidance that then would roll out through organizations like Dimmertai. But everything's kind of coming together and it is a perfect time and place to establish a formalized process that we can work together. And the good thing is we've been talking for a while even prior to any of this happening. So it's just a matter of kind of finding the authorization and the ability. Yeah. 
Okay. One more question, and then we got the, the next group. No, and, and that is a, that's an excellent point. So one of the good things the Air Force has done is they do have the SIM Operator Course 101 and 201. However, one of the things we've talked about and we realize is that the skill set that we require from operators and the things that we want people to do in terms of training, because most of the education and most of the learning that comes from the training is in the debriefing. We're not good at debriefing. We train people debriefing. So one of the things we would really like to do and to make as part of this is what is to come up with a standardized course for Here's the, here's the training for the instructors. So if you want to come and you want to you know, basically teach at this program, here's our training program for how to do it. There's a Harvard course that's about $5,000. It's awesome for debriefing. It's terrible for actual operation. Okay, we, um, we actually just heard from the, the maintenance of certification from the American Society of Anesthesia. They want us to put on a standard course to train their MOCA, um, which is maintenance of certification operators because they don't they don't even have a standard so I completely agree if we don't train the operators then it it's kind of a loss and it's easier to get stuff it's easier to get money for stuff than it is people put that on your student list I'm really yeah, I got it all right all right so good I, um, I know he'll stay uh, uh, I hope around after this I'll next brief and then again appreciate it. thanks